everyone, it's Miss Stacy back with Chapter 10 of Hudson Taylor. Today we're going to learn how he became one of the crowd. The other missionaries watched Hudson closely. The Chinese Evangelization Society was a new organization, and they wanted to see how it cared for its only worker. And what they saw was not impressive. To them, the society had sent out an unqualified, unmarried man without any instructions as to what they wanted him to do, and judging by his clothes and the food he ate with very little income. What were they thinking? After several months, Hudson was beginning to wonder the same thing. He became more and more lonely. He didn't dare tell anyone how difficult things really were for him. Doing so would only give the other missionaries more reason to criticize the Chinese Evangelization Society. Finally, did, letters did begin to arrive from the society. Hudson received his letter of credit and was able to arrange to get some money to pay his expenses. But the money was never enough. The society paid him a salary of 80 pounds per year, from which he had to meet all his expenses. Single missionaries with the London Missionary Society were paid £700 a year, as well as having their rent and other expenses paid. Hudson wrote to the Chinese Evangelization Society and explained to them how the war had driven up the price of everything in Shanghai. He asked if they could possibly increase the amount of money they paid him, in light of the increased cost. The letter he received back was not what he expected. Instead of increasing Hudson's salary, the society announced that it was sending another missionary to work in Shanghai, and not just a single person like Hudson, but a man with a wife and two children. In fact, Dr. Parker and his family were already on their way on a ship called the Swiftsure. Hudson wanted to feel delighted at the thought of having another missionary from the Chinese Evangelization Society with him in Shanghai, but mostly he was filled with a sense of dread. As usual, the society had sent no instructions on how they wanted him to prepare for Dr. Parker's arrival. He supposed they would want him to rent a house that they could all live in and set up a society headquarters in China. But he kept telling the society in his letters back to them in London that there was not a house to be rented in the whole international settlement because of the siege. Hudson was 21 years old, barely able to survive on his meager income, and now he also had to be responsible for a whole family in a, in a city where not a house or room was available to, for rent. He wondered how much the Chinese Evangelization Society had told the Parkers about conditions in Shanghai. When they arrived, would they be as surprised as the conditions as he had been? Hudson had eaten his first meal in China with the Burdens, a young, a young couple with the London Missionary Society. The Burdens and Hudson had become good friends and spent much time together. Now Mrs. Burden lay dying of cholera. Hudson spent long hours at the Burden's house caring for Mrs. Burden, her husband John, who was also ill, and their three-month-old baby daughter. Finally, on September 26, Mrs. Burden died, and with great sorrow, Hudson made the arrangements for her funeral service and burial. Slowly, John Burden regained his strength, and at the end of October, he decided to move out of his house and in with the London Missionary Society's chaplain, whose wife was going to help him look after his small daughter. John Burden offered to rent the house to Hudson, who gladly accepted. It was now mid-November, and each morning Hudson walked to the docks to see if there was news of the Swiftsure's arrival. When there was no word on its arrival after many days, he began to wonder if it had been shipwrecked. He was even more anxious after he heard the news that the Dumfries had been wrecked on the return voyage to England, though thankfully Captain Moritz and his crew were saved. Finally, on November 27, 1854, two weeks late, the Swisher sailed up the Huangpu River to Shanghai. The ship docked, and Hudson greeted the Parkers warmly. To his surprise, although the Parkers left England with two children, they arrived in Shanghai with three. Mrs. Parker had given birth during the voyage. <clears throat> Hudson arranged for some coolies to carry their baggage, and nine months after he had made the same track himself, he led them all through the streets of the International Settlement to the London Mission Society compound. At the compound, he showed the Parkers to the new headquarters of the Chinese Evangelization Society. Even with Hudson's belongings spread around the house, it looked empty. There was little furniture in the house because all Hudson's money had gone towards paying the rent. Buying furniture had to wait. The next morning, Hudson and Dr. Parker, an independent-minded Scotsman, went down to the British consulate to collect the mail. Dr. Parker had been told that the Chinese Evangelization Society would have a letter of credit waiting for him when he arrived. And just as Hudson had been, Dr. Parker was shocked when no such letter was waiting for him. It was a familiar story by now to Hudson. It was good, though, having a fellow worker in the mission. 
Hudson and Dr. Parker would sit and talk and scheme and plan late into the evening. Yet despite the company, Hudson felt gloomy. He had been in China nearly a year now, and he was still stuck in Shanghai. He ached to be able to start moving inland, but with the war and the hostile attitude toward foreigners, there was little he could do until the situation changed. And of course, he was the most experienced missionary in the Chinese Evangelization Society, and with that came the responsibility for taking care of the Parkers. It was ironic. Here in Shanghai, the heart of China seemed further from Hudson's reach than it had ever back in England. Finally, in February 1855, Hudson got some good news. Alexander Wiley and John Burden had managed to organize permits that would allow them to travel inland for one week, and they wanted Hudson to go with them. On the second day of their trip, they decided to hold a worship service on top of a hill from which they could see Shanghai far off in the distance. It was a beautiful spot, and they were soon lost in thanking God for his wonderful creation and for allowing them to the privilege of being his servants in China. As they worshipped, Hudson glanced in the direction of Shanghai and saw a huge cloud of smoke rising from the city. It could only mean one thing. Shanghai had fallen to the Imperial Army, but at what cost? The three men abandoned their trip and hurried back to Shanghai, not knowing what they would find, and as they made their way back, they passed fleeing people who told the three missionaries that rather than give up, the red turbans had blown up the south gate and set fire to the city. The Imperial Army had then entered the city and began killing people. It was a bloodbath, and the terror of it was written on the faces of those fleeing. When they reached the city, they found it just as they had been told. There were bodies everywhere. It seemed as though there wasn't a house or building in the whole city that wasn't burned. Death and destruction were everywhere. Looking at the scene made Hudson feel sick. Fortunately, except for the damage of a few stray cannonballs, the international settlement escaped unscathed. That night for the first time, since Hudson had arrived in China, the city of Shanghai was silent. There were no bombs, no explosions, there was only the silence of death. The missionaries worked hard in the following weeks, ministering to those who had survived the slaughter, and slowly from the rubble a new Shanghai began to rise. Since the earlier trip had been cut short, Hudson and John Burden decided to make another one. This time they would head for Tung Chow, farther up the Yangtze River. Tung Chow was also known as Satan's Seat, because the people of the city were so lawless and hard to control. There was so much crime in the city that most people chose to avoid it altogether. They hired two small junks and headed up the river. When they reached the dock, the captains of the two junks became very worried about Hudson and John Burden's safety. Surely they had heard of the city's reputation. So Hudson thought of an escape plan. If he and John Burden did not return by nightfall, one junk was to go back to the, down the river to Shanghai as quickly as possible with the news they had been captured. The other junk would anchor near the dock just in case the two men managed to escape. With their plan made, both men slept soundly and packed their bags at first light. The city of Tung Chow was actually a distance from the dock on the river, so Hudson, John Burden, and a servant began the walk to town. The road, though, was very rough and they had to walk slowly. Finally, they decided it would be quicker to hire wheelbarrows and pushers to take them to Tung Chow. Wheelbarrows were a common form of transportation in China. They were large enough so that a man could sit in one room in one with room left over for baggage. They hired three wheelbarrows and loaded themselves in along with the Chinese Bibles and tracts they were carrying and held on for the ride. The wheelbarrow pushers knew every bump in the road and guided their barrows around most of them. As they bounced along, the servant who was accompanying them had time to think about where he was going and with whom. Finally, when someone spat at him for traveling with foreign devils, it became too much for him. He yelled for the wheelbarrow pushers to stop and begged Hudson and John Burden to let him return to the junks. Seeing how scared he was, the missionaries agreed. They were getting close to the city when an important-looking man motioned for them to stop. He spoke to them in Mandarin and begged both of them to turn around. Tung Chow was not a safe place for foreigners, and he didn't think they deserved to die there. The man walked on, but now the wheelbarrow pushers were unwilling to go any farther. They were convinced the foreign devils riding in their wheelbarrows would be attacked and killed, and if they were in the way, they might be killed too. So they ordered Hudson and John Burden out and jogged off with their barrows in the opposite direction. Hudson found two new wheelbarrow pushers willing to take them into the city, but they demanded to be paid danger money for their effort. Eventually, without their servant and with new pushers, Hudson and John Burden found themselves entering the west gate of Tung Chow. They climbed out of their wheelbarrows. Dust and sweat had mixed together to form little rivers of mud that ran down their necks and dripped from their brows. 
Hudson pulled some Bibles from his bag and began asking people if they could read. If a person said he could, he gave them a Bible and explained that it was God's message to him. Several people thanked him. Things seemed to be going quietly, but not for long. A huge, jump, drunken man pushed his way to the front of the crowd that had gathered around the two men, grabbed Hudson by the throat, and began choking him. Hudson gasped and sputtered and tried to pry the man's hand off his throat. John Burden began yelling, We demand to be taken to the Mandarin! The drunken man loosened his grip on Hudson. We know what to do with you, he sneered. A roar went up from the crowd, and people began poking at the two missionaries with sticks. Kill the foreign devils, they began to chant. By now, Hudson's captor was dragging him along by the neck. Another two men were dragging John Burden. Even so, John Burden was able to reach into his bag and throw out tracks to the people. Throwing at, out tracks so annoyed many people in the mob. They began jabbing their sticks at the two missionaries with greater force than before. Remember how the apostles rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer in the cause of Christ? Hudson yelled back to John Burden in English. The huge drunken man tightened his grip on Hudson's throat so he could say no more. Hudson had to do something, but what? He remembered his identity card in the left pocket of his pants. Slowly, he slid his hand down in the pocket. He could feel the card. Quickly, he grabbed it and waved it in the air. I demand to be taken to the Mandarin, he yelled. The sight of an official identity card quieted the mob. The card meant the two men they were dragging along probably had important friends. Perhaps it would be better to take them to the Mandarin after all they decided. Hudson slumped down in front of the Mandarin's house, totally exhausted. His throat burned and his whole body felt out of joint. The ringleaders of the mob went outside to talk to the Mandarin. The rest of the mob crowded in around the two of them. John Burden, though, saw a great opportunity. Here was a large crowd who had never heard about Jesus. He propped himself up against a wall for support and began preaching to the crowd. A few minutes later, the Mandarin servants came out and dragged Hudson and John Burden inside the gates. They pulled the two of them to their feet and told them that they were going to see Qian Ta Laoi, the great venerable grandfather Qin, the Mandarin of Tung Chao. Hudson and John Burden were led into a room filled with polished wood furniture and painted silk pictures. The great venerable grandfather Qin sat on a cushioned chair at the far end of the room. The Mandarin welcomed them both. He took them into a private room and offered them some tea. Hudson was glad to drink it as it soothed his throat. Grandfather Chen explained to them that he knew many things. He had been an official in Shanghai and knew about the Treaty of Nanking and that foreigners were not to be treated roughly. He asked what they were doing in Tung Chao and since Hudson spoke the better Mandarin, he answered Chen's questions. He explained that they were bringing the truth of God to the people of the city and how they had not meant to cause a disturbance. He also explained that the crowd had not treated them kindly and that he hoped things might go smoothly from now on. The Mandarin nodded. He was glad the visitors had not complained about his citizens, like most foreigners would. These were foreigners who knew some Chinese manners. Hudson asked the great venerable grandfather Chen if he could leave a Bible for him to read, and if they could give out the rest of their Bibles and tracts in the town. The Mandarin nodded his head, and more, he even provided them with an escort so they would not be disturbed again. This time, out on the streets, Hudson and John Burden were treated as important guests of the Mandarin. If people did not move out of the way quickly enough and let them through, their escorts used their long queues as whips to clear the way. So, with the protection of the Mandarin's pigtail whipping guards, the two missionaries gave out the last of their tracts and Bibles. Much to everyone's surprise, the missionaries arrived back at the junks in one piece and before dark. During the next year, Hudson, accompanied by various other missionaries, made several more trips inland from Shanghai. He also took a trip down the coast to another of the treaty ports, ports Ningpu. Dr. Parker accompanied him on the trip. There were many missionaries working in Ningpo, and there were also lots of foreign merchants and officials. But in all the city, there was no medical clinic or doctor. Hudson and Dr. Parker prayed and talked about the opportunity that existed. Finally, they decided that Dr. Parker and his family should move to Ningpo and set up a hospital. As Hudson made his trips inland, he wrestled with a problem. What William Lockshe told had told him four years before at the meeting in London was true. Even when he was only 10 or 20 miles from Shanghai, he scared people. They were not used to his foreign clothes, polished shoes, or curly blonde hair. He remembered that to blend in, Dr. Medhurst had dressed in Chinese clothing when he made his earlier trips into inland China. So he spoke to Dr. Medhurst about the situation, and the doctor encouraged Hudson to start wearing Chinese clothing. He, his wearing Chinese clothes might make Chinese people happy, 
but Hudson had a feeling it would make many of the other missionaries angry. They thought they were civilizing the Chinese, and an Englishman dressed in Chinese clothing had things completely the wrong way round. Besides, looking British was a protection. Everyone knew that to harm a person dressed in English clothes was to insult the powerful British Empire. But as Hudson thought more about it, he became convinced there were more good points than bad to dressing like the Chinese. And not only dressing like them, but looking like them as well. He hired a barber who cut off the blonde curls that hung on his forehead. Then the barber shaved the front half of Hudson's head. The razor made a few small cuts in his scalp that stung when the barber smeared black hair dye on his remaining hair. Once the dyeing was complete, the barber braided a fox cue into his newly blackened curls. Next, Hudson brought, bought himself some Chinese clothes and put them on. He started with the pants, which were enormous. The waist seemed twice as wide as he was. The merchant was right. One size for, did, did, definitely did fit all. Fortunately, the men wore their pants with a belt, so he put the belt on and bunched the top of the pants inside it. Next, he put on socks. They felt scratchy on his feet, and they had no elastic at the top. The legs of his oversized pants were tucked into the socks, and two very strong garters were used to hold the pants down and the socks up. He put on a plain cotton shirt, over which an embroidered tunic was then pulled. The tunic reached all the way to Hudson's feet, hiding his baggy pants. The sleeves of the tunic hung 18 inches below his fingertips. Every time he wanted to do something with his hands, he had to remember to roll the sleeves up, then fold them down again afterwards. It seemed quite impractical to Hudson, but that was how Chinese men wore them. The shoes, though, proved the most difficult to get on. He had to fold his socks against his feet and then maneuver the cloth shoes over the top of them. The shoes were designed to curl up at the toes, and the curls kept catching on the bottom of his tunic. Hudson looked at himself in the mirror. He was now a blue-eyed Chinaman. Even so, it took a while before he was brave enough to walk outdoors in his new outfit. But when he did, he discovered that people didn't give him a second glance. After being so different for so long, it was strange to walk past a Chinese person without being stared at or to not draw a crowd when he stopped to buy fruit in the market. For the first time since he left London, he felt, really felt like one of the crowd. Okay, we'll be back next time for Chapter 11. Talk to you soon.